Texas and play with their stuff. I've seen their stuff. It's pretty incredible. Uh, as I said, goals of this presentation is general overview of what HPC actually is. And realistically, what it is is taking a cluster, such as what you've seen out here out front, but expanding it to massive sizes. We're talking large rooms, larger than this. Uh, the cluster that I have deals with, it fits this room, and then we've got this room again for expansion at the moment. Uh, hardware requirements for such a cluster, and I'm gonna go into detail about uh, not just the physical hardware for, for the compute, but also what kind of power do you need for that? What kind of cooling do you need for that? What kind of you know, infrastructure support base are you gonna need for that? It gets pretty in depth and there's a lot of equipment that you need, which obviously adds to the cost. Uh, software requirements for the cluster, keeping it going. As you expand, and I, I deal with general performance computing, we, uh, we have to deal with a lot of different customers. Uh, we have applications all over the board because we support the entire university. So bio community, mathematics, uh, actually not very much from computer science, but uh, astronomy, physics, chemistry, all of these groups come in and run software on our equipment. And we have to be able to support all of that, which means huge code base, uh, lots of infrastructure support, lots of software support. I typically don't do a lot of the software support, but I can, play, I can dance the tune. Um, with the users, they have a lot of different software, and you, you could talk about any code base. You could be running in Python, Perl, I have seen MATLAB, tons and tons and tons of R code, particularly from the bio community. Uh, C, C++, lots of Fortran from the older people, from chemistry, physics, those guys. Yeah, for, I, I see some smiling faces there for Fortran. We see a ton of it. And there, there, there's actually reasons for having code bases like that, for Fortran and C in particular. And they have the strongest support for massively parallel uh, programs. So they're not running programs that are, you know, eight cores, you know, threaded. They're running 30,000 cores across six, three, four, five, six hundred machines running MPI base and high speed interconnects between each of those machines. So, what is HPC? I wrote some things up. This is a fun one. Uh, I, I looked up, hey, what actually defines a supercomputer? And the most recent definition I could find for, was dated from 2007. And it was, uh, what is that, 10 to the 10th floating points calculations per second. You can do that now with a four, with basically just four machines. Four Intel machines, you can do that. That's how fast it's gone. So when it comes to supercomputing and HPC, they're actually still following Moore's law when it comes to computing. Uh, as I said, most common users are scientific researchers, but I also know of uh, supercomputers in the financial institutions. They do a lot of stuff there. Uh, oil and gas is another big one. Uh, computational research, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, weather, weather's a big one these days. It's all over the place, and it can be done. You just need a lot of infrastructure and support for it. I just threw this graph up together. I, I, this is actually off of the uh, top 500 list. I threw some numbers together of the number one computer off the top 500 list for the last 15, 20 years. And you can see it's following Moore's law. That is a logarithmic scale on the left. Logarithm base 10 all the way up, and it's kind of pretty much linear. It is absolutely incredible, the growth, and it just 
it hasn't stopped. Um, barriers. System complexity. You think that these little uh, Raspberry Pi machines out here are uh, complex when it comes to setup? When until you have 500 machines, each with dual 10 gig connections, plus 40 gig uh, InfiniBand connections, plus gigabit ethernet for management. We use gigabit ethernet for management. Actually, it's 56, it's EDR. HDR has um, run into some issues. <laughs> we'll, we'll see some HDR stuff uh, probably in the next six months to a year once TAC has figured out how to make it work. They've got, TAC actually has uh, Mellanox engineers on site right now working on Frontera to make it work. So that's, we're keeping in close contact with that to make sure, okay, have you fixed it? Have you fixed it? Okay, now we can buy. <laughs> uh, cost to maintain. The last cluster that I, that I had to deal with in purchasing, purchasing, we got a good deal. We spent $7 million on about $11 million worth of equipment. That got us 30,000 cores with InfiniBand infrastructure uh, at FDR speeds, 56 gigabit. It's a, it, this is a costly venture, so you have to have something that you're going to run it for and make it worthwhile. Um, and it's not just the compute hardware that's the costly part. I would say that compute hardware was maybe 40% of the actual total cost initially. And this is, this is just initial purchase. We're not even talking all the power costs afterwards. So you've got all of that hardware, now you have to power it somehow, which means PDUs, bringing in power from the power company. Um, you have to have networking to your host. We're running, we're currently running dual 100 gigabit to, uh, to our cluster. And we were fortunate we, we got that about six, seven years ago, but it's getting time to upgrade that and we'll probably be going to dual 200 gigabit soon. Uh, cooling, power, just the floor plates, floor space for it. It's all costly. Uh, expertise. There are very few people that work at this level of HPC work. We need people. Please, you know, bone up and we'll hire you. We need the people. Um, When, I, when I've done job searches for new people, I get one person out of 50 that is even remotely qualified, and we're going to have to train them. Uh, they're not teaching it in schools. It's something that you just sort of have to love and work from there. Uh, software licensing, it's actually a small portion, but we do run into it. Uh, MATLAB, site licenses, Linux site licenses, we're actually running Red Hat proper because the university paid for a site license, so we're like, we'll use it. <laughs> so yeah, we're running about two or 3,000 licenses of Red Hat from just off the site license. Uh, MATLAB, we're using site license for a bunch of other things. So licensing becomes a big deal at that scale. You know, a single license, okay, I, I've spent my $300 and I'm good to go. Not when you've got 1,500 machines. Um, other software licenses that we run into is for things like storage systems. Uh, let's see, storage systems, mostly storage systems actually. Uh, oh, and scheduling systems. Some schedulers I've seen cost into the $100,000 a year for our system. It was like, we're gonna go open source. We're gonna go open source on this and we're gonna go open source on this and this storage well, we really, really need the performance, so okay, we'll pay you. That kind of thing. Uh, it, it's always a balance of figuring out what we can afford, what we cannot, and what we can make do with in terms of using people instead of money. So I, I sort of broken this down to three layers of high-performance computing. You've got your hardware, 
layer, which I've sort of I've pretty much spoken about, but we'll go into more detail. Oops, uh, where'd I go? Middleware, which is all the scheduling and uh, other little software in between the hardware and the user. So it's also your compilers, uh, Finiban layer, stuff like that. And then your applications, which is your users. And I'm actually not gonna go very into detail with that because the application layer, there are so many. We have 800 different users on our system at the moment. And if I showed you the applications directory, it just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls of all the different applications. Most of them Python. Hardware. This is actually a picture of TAC. This is the Stampede cluster uh, in, at University of Texas. Uh, this is, oddly enough, 6,400 nodes, 522,000 cores. Yeah, this is a monster. 260 terabytes total of memory. Uh, I've toured this thing, going down the hot aisle. This is actually, the uh, computer room is actually divided into cold aisle, hot aisle, and they do hot aisle containment. So the hot aisles are actually contained and all that hot air is held into a, just a small channel and then cooled. I've gone into the hot aisle and it's like going into about 105 degrees which isn't that bad. I've, I've seen worse, and I've heard of worse. Uh, they've got 14 petabytes of storage currently, but this is all kind of moot because they're putting Frontera into place right now. They're probably working in there right now, debugging InfiniBand, most likely. Uh, that's gonna be 4.8 teraflops of compute power. Uh, and they're estimating that they're gonna make it into the top five or the top 500 list in September. So that's a pretty big deal. Uh, storage, lots of different uh, storage variations. We have to provide storage to all of these different machines and typically it's all from a single namespace of storage. NFS at this scale doesn't really cut it. Uh, Luster seems to be the big game player these days. One, because it's free. And two, because it does actually perform pretty well. However, Luster still has issues, particularly with small files. And on our cluster in particular, we're seeing lots of users with lots and lots of small, small files. Uh, our last count, we did an estimation. We're looking at about 70% of the file system used, that's about two petabytes of storage, 70% of that was files all less than 64K. I've seen directories with hundreds of thousands of files in it. I'm sorry? That it, can be, it can be a number of things. Most likely it's intermediate data that they've generated, they have no clue. A lot of users have no clue what they've got on this cluster. It's very, it's very common. You know, we'll ask them, what is this? And they're like, oh, I did that six years ago. <laughs> Why didn't you remove it? Well, uh, which is yet another issue uh, is data retention. A number of our professors have grants where they say, you cannot, you have to hold on to this data forever. Where do you store that? It's, it gets crazy. Uh, these parallel file systems, they do not do small files well. No file system out there deals with small files very well. We're starting to uh, get some better methods for dealing with it, uh, with flash buffers, um, data on uh, metadata storage, things like that. Uh, but it's a fighting battle. It's tough. Uh, what we wish they would do is fix their code <laughs> so that we're not dealing with small, small files all the time. Uh, this is actually a problem with the bio community in particular because they are a very young community. 
they're, they're new to the game, they, their coding practices are infantile, effectively. Uh, your physicists, your chemists, they've been in the game for 50 years. They were coding in Fortran 66 on CDC machines years and years and years ago where they had 64K of RAM. They know how to take code and make it really, really efficient. And those coding practices have boiled over to today, and they still do it. The biologists, they've come in five, six, ten years ago, and they've got machines with multiple gigabytes of RAM. They say, well, let's use it. And their methods for dealing with the data has exploded well beyond that to the point where I am now having to purchase, at times, machines that have one and a half terabytes of RAM. And I can go bigger. If I need to, there are machines out there that'll have six terabytes and they will use it. And that's just memory. I wish I didn't have to do that, but I do. Uh, when it comes to scheduling, the, the, this is the other half of their infantile methods for programming. Uh, they will schedule programs to run for 30 days or more. We have a 30-day maximum runtime on our cluster, which is huge compared to, if you, if you go around to other educational institutions, they're like, yeah, 72 hours, that's our maximum. For 30 days, and they will use it. And then at the end of the 30 days, they'll complain to us and say, we need more. And we're like, no, checkpoint your data. How do I do that? They don't have the, clue, they don't have the idea of how to checkpoint their data. So. Again, more battles. Uh, GPFS, getting back to this, GPFS is uh, obviously the IBM uh, variant. It's expensive, and it has about the same performance as Luster. There might be some corner cases where it better outperforms Luster and vice versa. Uh, BGFS is actually relatively new on the scene. Uh, they've got a, some, not, they've, they're known to have a bit better performance when it comes to uh, smaller files, but it's new. And there are some other features that we really wish they had that they don't have yet. Uh, declustered RAID, so I'm kind of jumping around here, but declustered RAID, RAID 5, RAID 6, problem with that is the drives are so huge now. What's your rebuild time? Rebuild time, you know, we're, we're getting 12 terabyte drives on our systems, and you do a RAID 8 plus 2, rebuild time on that is multiple days. What's the chances of having a triple drive failure during that time? It's not infinitesimally small. It's actually possible, and it's becoming more and more possible as these drives get larger and the rebuild times get longer. Uh, I've heard at least one time or another where there is now like a, a RAID 7 type schema, which is literally triple drive redundancy. <laughs> but uh, have they? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's what effectively just declustered RAID is, is they're distributing the parity across the drives in smaller chunks. So and they're scattered all over the place. So rebuilding a drive is just like that. I've, I've seen 12 drive, uh, a 12 terabyte drive rebuild take 15 minutes. That's nothing. So that they're coming out. Unfortunately, the cluster grade kind of stuff, that's proprietary. You're going to pay for it. But that's part of the game. I believe so. I'm not sure. Uh, we haven't de dealt with it. I, I know who to talk to to find out. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got friends. <laughs> uh, and I could find out for you if you wanted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. We haven't really delved, delved into Ceph. It's not a huge user base on Ceph at the moment. Luster really is the big user base these days. Uh, 
when it comes to luster, here we go. Top 500 list, more than 50% on the top 500 list are using luster. Uh, I know TAC is using it. We tend to follow what TAC does because they've got the um, employee base to make things right. And we say, well, that's the way we should go. <laughs> uh, as I said, you know, life sciences, oil and gas, finance, lots of people using it. It does the job in a general way pretty well. Computational hardware. This is the nuts and bolts of what we're doing here. Uh, the CPUs themselves, mostly Intel at this level. We have seen some AMD and we're seeing, I think, a, a growing uh, use with Epic now, but we won't see it, I don't think we're gonna really see it explode until at least the second generation really comes out properly. The first generation was really good for storage systems because of the increased PCI, but uh, for the compute, Epic, uh, Intel was still beating them out with uh, their second generation here. We'll see, I guess. Uh, I have good hopes. I, I like to see the competition because uh, with the competition comes lower prices for us, obviously. Uh, power, let's face it, they're pretty much dead and you're stuck with IBM. <laughs> and for Media Tech, we have a power cluster. Right, and how good is it? You know, comparatively, there you go. <laughs> uh, it, ARM, we would love to see ARM come up and actually start playing in this arena properly. I'd love to see it. It hasn't happened yet. We're, we're, we're still hopeful. GPUs, let's face it, NVIDIA has it pretty much down. Uh, AMD, they, the, the Radeon chips, they can do it. They, they can do it. They, they've got pretty much the same amount of capability. The problem is the software base. NVIDIA got it right. They went out there and said, hey, let's, uh, let's get this GPU stuff going by hiring a bunch of programmers and picking out, I don't know, a dozen, 15, 20 major programs and convert them over to using GPUs as well in order to enhance them properly and give them out for free. And they kept that up. And that created that for them a major user base and a code base that everybody is using now. So they've got the momentum and nobody else can catch up. AMD can't catch up at all. Uh, Intel tried with the Mike Phi systems. I don't know if anybody's ever played with those. It was horrible. Uh, it's just, that's the name of the game. In, NVIDIA is the way to go. And they're going to make money off of it. FP, yes? On your uh, Florida, mm -hmm. you know, uh, do you guys have different clusters that are like one CPU heavy, one CPU heavy, or does your scheduler take care of that? Our scheduler takes care of that. So it's actually relatively monolithic, and they're all con connected via Luster to the same file system. And then we do have, so it's all, when a, when a user puts in a program into the, into the scheduler, it will be scheduled on one of the subsets of the clusters, but they could get either one. You know, they could get the new uh, Skylake nodes, they could get the, the older stuff, they could get our old AMD Opterons that we have. And the reason we do that is we have found that I would say 95%, if not more, of our users don't care about how long the job runs. They don't care. All they care about is how quickly it starts running. It's weird. It's, you know, they don't care. It could run five times longer so long as they get five seconds faster on their start time. That's all they care about. I, I see the laughing and you're like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's just, it's a weird, sociological thing where they just, all they care about is when it starts. FPGAs, I don't really know very much about them. Uh, we don't use them. 
we do have a research group that is experimenting with them, but they're small and we don't have, they're very specialized, is part of the problem, and we're doing general HPC. So if you've got an application and you need to run millions upon millions of that program, FPGAs might be the way to go. For us, no. We would be re reconfiguring them all the time and sucking up many people re doing that reconfiguration. It's not worth it for us. Uh, general, uh, as I said, Intel dominates AMD less than 1% of the top 500 list. That, I'm hoping that'll climb in the next year or so, but we'll see. Um, as I said, Epic is very highly suited for file servers. Yes? Um, I have high hopes, you know, I, I'd love to see great performance numbers out of that so that other people look at it and say, hey, let's do that. Because, you know, that's, and that's what we need. We need groups like Oak Ridge, uh, TAC, all the other type folks out there that are really, really big to try some of these other systems, make them work and show the numbers to us so that we can say, that's the way to go. That that kind of system suits our needs. Yes. Oak Ridge Natural Labs is uh, it's, what it's in Tennessee, yeah. Knoxville area. Um, they are a national research lab. Have lots of large clusters, uh, some of which aren't visible to the public. Uh, they, I think they do quite a bit of uh, nuclear research, that kind of thing. Let's see, node types. So breaking down a cluster, we've got compute nodes, which are pretty obvious, they run your jobs. Uh, middleware support nodes, so your directory services, LDAP, that kind of thing, DNS, schedulers. End user support nodes, which would be your web servers, your wiki databases, and your actual database servers for users that actually need them. Uh, we're seeing a growing need for, in particular, the file users. They have a database or three that they need to query against in order to run their data. You gotta support that database somehow. All of this gets made more complex by high availability. So <laughs> that web server needs to be highly available you know, because you're promoting your systems. Uh, your DNS needs to be highly available because, well, if your DNS server dies, your entire cluster dies. It's not good to have a single point of failure. Uh, your database servers, good idea to have it highly available. We're, all of that used to cost quite a bit of money. A lot of those things nowadays, they can be put, thrown into VMs, then you have a pair of VMs doing the high availability for you, and you've got it distributed across those. Great. GPUs, I already did this, but NVIDIA's pretty much the king. Uh, OpenCL is just not strongly adopted. Just the, that's the way it is. Server room infrastructure, power. Right now we are running uh, 208 as our bus lines down, or no, what are we running? We're running four, 408? That's broken down to 208 for each of the legs. <clears throat> In all of our machines, uh, they're now talking bringing down even down to 280 in each leg, and then uh, bringing that down just so that we can bring the voltage up and distribute our power better. Uh, each rack we're having right now, we, we we've sort of set the cutoff to be 60 amps per rack. Uh, we've seen people who are doing 80, and this is all air cooled equipment. You can do more with water-cooled, but with air-cooled, 60 is sort of your limit, 80 if you really push it. And the, the folks that I, I think the folks that I knew who were doing 80 had uh, chiller doors on the rear. So we don't have any chiller doors. We're at 60 amps per rack, and it gets hot. It gets hot in those racks. Rack, 
one rack, one, one, two feet wide, 48 U. Uh, we're probably around 700 kW right now. 700 kilowatts. 100. 700 kilowatts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of power. Lots and lots of power. And then we have to cool that. Um, you know what? This is a weird thing about University of Florida. I don't know. I have no clue. <clears throat> How are we paying for this? Are we getting any deals from the electric company for this? I have no idea. I highly recommend being your own power company. We actually had, do have that to some extent, but yes. That's nice. We don't get that. <laughs> um, I don't know, and the reason I don't know is because the way we purchased the building, we purchased it on a 99-year lease from the UF Foundation, who owned the building, and we bought it on the terms of they pay for the power. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> I think they will care if we ever load out this room completely and all of a sudden start drawing all the power we can, they will suddenly start caring. Uh, with that notion and you know, those constraints, we actually do try to minimize our power usage as much as possible. Yes? What is the gross square footage of your background? 50,000 square? 25,000 square feet. And then we've, got, we've actually got a second one right next door, but that is more for the uh, university infrastructure, so their billing and student grades and everything. Uh, their power draw for supporting the entire rest of the university is around 150 kilowatts. You don't use the free power and spare cycles to buy Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> We've had a couple of instances where, oh look, somebody's running Bitcoin. But it's, it's actually been few and far between. We've, we've been semi-lucky on that. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, the cooling, it's hot aisle, cold aisle containment. We're not doing containment yet, but we will be. Uh, obviously, we need higher cooling capacity for all that heat being generated. And to do that, we've got multiple chillers, multiple uh, cracks, which are basically air handlers. And all of that is redundant. Uh, all of our stuff is also uh, fully UPS backup. So power goes out, UPS kicks in, backup generator fires up, takes over the power. At the moment, we haven't exceeded the, the capability of the generator. We will. And then they'll have to figure something else out. Our, our building is rated for a Cat 3 hurricane, which in the center of northern Florida is probably all we need. Uh, if something actually hits central Florida at Cat 4 or higher, uh, the coastline is gone at that point because they've been hit with essentially a Cat 6. There's a lot of terrain for that Cat 3 to get through before it really hurts us. So we're actually in a good part of the state in terms of hurricanes. And besides, it's just a hurricane. Yeah. You, can, you can tell I'm from Florida. Uh, networking, as I said, we've got dual 100 gigabit links coming into the server room, and those are our only two networking connections to the outside world on this cluster. That's it. Everything else is inside the room, and it's miles and miles and miles of networking cable. But to the outside world, it's two fiber links. Um, we'll be seeing, uh, as I said, we'll probably be seeing that upgraded to dual 200 gig or possibly 400 at some point. The nice thing about that is that that 100 gigabit link also uh, creates a ring bus pretty much around the state. So there's a full uh, Lambda rail network around the state. Uh, InfiniBand, we're, as I said, we're doing 56 gigabit right now. That 56 gigabit connects every compute node 
to each other and also to our storage, except NFS. NFS is handled by a 40 gigabit, and that's just our home areas. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, three by 270 tons on the cooling at the moment, and we'll probably be adding a fourth in the next year or so. Uh, fiber optic is, as, as I said, dual 10, 100 gigabit. Um, we've got 72 hours of uh, runtime on the generator. If we go that, go, to, go beyond that, We'll, we will probably start shutting down our systems before that happens in order to give the university infrastructure longer times because we're just, we're just research. You know what? Research can stop, but the lifeblood of the, of the university is that other room, so let them run longer. Uh, as I said, Cat 3 Hurricane and, oh, two 5,000 square foot rooms, not 25, sorry. I know how big they are by sight. That's about it. And this is our cluster at the moment. Um, back in fall of 2015, we uh, made 113th. Uh, Clemson beat us out by one. That was very annoying. They did it underhandedly by buying some extra GPUs and uh, rerunning their code to beat us out by one. <laughs> it's a bit of a competition, but we're actually starting to not look at the top 500 as being a useful number for us. Uh, the, the regions of high-performance computing has started to splinter a bit in what you're using the cluster for. And in terms of pure compute power, that's not everything. Uh, we're now starting to look more heavily at something called the IO500, which is looking purely at the top 500 uh, storage systems in the country and how they perform. And we think that a good combination of the two is actually much more important. Uh, let's see. Middleware. Okay, here we go. Oh my God. It's 11, 20 minutes. Uh, Linux, I don't know of any system out there, at least in the top 500 list, that doesn't use Linux. Right, there might be one, yeah. But for the most part, everybody uses Linux. Uh, for our provisioning, which is getting the operating system out to each of those nodes, because we're not running around with a USB key. Uh, we're using, <laughs> we sort of used to. Uh, we're, we're currently using Foreman and Puppet, uh, which works very well for us. Uh, Rox is another option that's been around longer. We did use that many, many years ago. That's about, that was about 15 years ago. Uh, but it's clunky. And not a lot of development has happened with it in years. Bright, yes? Sorry, that's in the background. But on, on the operating system, uh -huh. you said you're running Red Hat. Yes. No, Red Hat we, we, it just works. We, we just use the Red Hat kernels. Yeah. We, we try to stay as close to uh, what is provided by others as we can because we're the customization, yes, it, it, it can be nice and it can improve things a little bit. But when one thing changes and it throws all that other stuff out, forget it. It's not worth it. It's not worth the time. And our team, we are. 13 people total for all of our research computing group. And only four of us are operations. So it's just not going to happen. Uh, Bright, another uh, provisioner. Uh, it's, I think it's owned by Dell or at least a subsidiary of Dell or something like that. I don't know. Uh, commercial, it's plug and play. You know, you pay for it and it just works. Maybe not very cleanly, maybe not perfectly, but if you're uh, single direction type computing, high performance computing kind of stuff, and you've got one application to run across bunches of clusters, might be the way to go. And makes it easier if you have a small, small team. Uh, scheduler, we are using Slurm. 
Uh, we used to be torquing with Moab and Maui. Uh, before that, we were actually PBS Pro, so I've actually dealt with all three of these. Slurm is the free one these days, and it's got the most development happening with it right now, and I think most features, and it's actually documented, and the things that they've documented actually work. If, it, if anybody here has used Moab, they understand my pain. They, have a, they had a lot of things documented, and we'd be like, but it's in the documentation. They're like, it is? Yes, right here. It was bad. Operating systems, as I said, we've been using Red Hat. Um, Ubuntu is out there uh, mostly for our users. Our users use it a lot because it's easy and it works, I guess. Uh, Scientific Linux, I don't know if anybody heard the news, but they're kind of done. Uh, Suzy, Crayland environment. Basically, I think for most of the clusters, you're seeing either Red Hat or CentOS. Uh, I don't know if anybody uses anything else in a larger cluster, but for the most part, it's Red Hat. Provisioning, as I said, we're using Foreman and Puppet. Uh, Foreman and Puppet, they're open source, based on popular software. Rocks, it's ancient. Nobody's using it these days except San Diego. Uh, not a lot of development going on. And Bright, again, is commercial. End user software. Here's the, here's the, uh, the crux of the problem here. Lots of packages out there, lots of different programs for users, and they will find them, and they will ask for them to be installed, or they will install them themselves, and they will require some oddball version of Python that you don't have installed, and all of a sudden, you have to have that installed as well. Uh, documentation, you get what you get. Uh, some developers document very well, others, here's your code, and it might work, it might not. Uh, Portability, we had that problem as well. You know, we're running Red Hat right now. We're still running Red Hat Seven, and we only just got to that in the last year. Uh, all these, you know, there's a lot of users out there who, I developed my software on Ubuntu, the latest version. Why don't you have these libraries and these library versions? Well, we're running Red Hat, and Red Hat is a little slow. Uh, I know Red Hat is supposed to be. Uh, going to a faster development cycle with Red Hat 8 so that they actually keep up a little bit, but we'll see. They don't, they don't use what? So the question is, uh, do I have users that don't use build agents that will replicate the, the software on the cluster? Ah. Okay. Um, the way we typically do it is we actually have an applications directory and we ask that the users, particularly if they use the software a lot or they have more, more than two or three people using it, we ask that they have, ask us to install it and we'll install it in the applications directory and then it's usable in the cluster, just period. And that seems to work pretty well. Uh, it's when we get a user who says, hey, I, use, I developed this piece of software on my laptop and it's not working on your system now. Why? Uh, we get that a lot. Uh, again, mostly from the bio community, unfortunately. Uh, and this comes to portability. Uh, containers are a godsend in this case. They really are. Uh, we're, we've been using Singularity, which is a more secure version of Docker, obviously. Uh, and that's been very successful. Uh, the CMS program, which is uh, the Large Hadron Collider, 
it's, an, it's a part of the Large Hadron Collider data and their research. We are a tier two site for them. And all of their software that runs on our cluster is done through Singularity containers, which has been wonderful. Uh, so yeah, unreliable software. 26% of the omics, so biomics, that kind of thing, uh, software are currently not accessible through URLs published in the paper. 26%. So they did this software, they, they did their paper on this, based on this piece of software, and the software is no longer available. So you can't re, uh, reproduce the results. 49% were deemed difficult to install. I think that was a low estimate. 28% of the tools failed to be installed due to problems on the implementation. So what this is telling me is that it's kind of a mess out there, at least in the scientific community, in terms of end user software. And that's where things really need to be worked on and cleaned up. Unfortunately, there's not exactly a lot of money out there to make that happen. I wish there was because it would make my job a lot easier. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. Uh, do I have any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. What kind of support can you provide to uh, end users in you know, developing those better to work better on clusters, working with them so that they actually integrate better, so that, oh, you're using tons of memory here. Well, let's rewrite this stuff. Right. Uh, in a situation like that, we are, we've, we've now hired a second person to help with that kind of situation. Uh, actually, he's, he presented here last year, Brian Bartholomew. Uh, we hired him. <laughs> and uh, I think he's going to be a really good person for that. So we actually do have people, and they're more aimed at the bio community people because they're the ones that need the most help in that regard. And that is one of the big things, you know, hey, your software is eating up one and a half terabytes of RAM on this machine. Why? With, with like 1% CPU. What is going on here? We've seen that. We have machines that are that big, you know, single machines that have one and a half terabytes of RAM. And they're using all the memory for no reason whatsoever. Uh, we've, we've seen other things where why is your code, which is supposed to be using these two GPUs, not using them at all? Well, oh, look, you, you're running the uh, non-GPU version of the software. Why are you doing that? You know, things like that. So we have an actual full team, and there's six of them. Almost half of our group is dedicated to dealing with those kinds of situations and problems. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, usually it's just a, a, a small portion of the cluster, but yeah, we've, we've seen you know, a user running their software you know, across multiple, multiple machines and one of the nodes dies, you know, bad hard drive or bad memory or something like that, and it ruins their software, it ruins their run. The answer to that is, well, rerun it. You know, we've taken that node out of the cluster, we're fixing it, rerun your software. We run the job because we don't have time to try and, you know, fix that. Right. We're not. There's no point. Just rerun the job. Anything else? Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. C groups. Uh, well, I don't know about. We're, we've been using C groups more for security rather than uh, actual tuning. So. Uh, the, the place that we typically use C groups is in our job scheduler. When the job runs on a node or a collection of nodes, uh, the other thing that it does is set memory and, well, basically memory constraints. So, hey, I've requested a job to run and it has allocated to it, I don't know, eight gigs of RAM and, you know, it's going to run for two days. Well, 
C groups are used to limit that job to that eight gigs of RAM, and if they try to exceed it, it kills the job. Uh, that's pretty much the limit of our real tuning for it. It's, it's more for job manipulation than anything. Yes and no. Okay. Um, we did all the kernel updates for it because that's, an, that's an, a, a given. However, a lot of the uh, Spectre vulnerabilities came from running hyperthreading. We don't do hyperthreading. We turned it off from the very beginning. Ten years ago, when hyperthreading came out, we turned it off because what we were finding is it wasn't actually helping us, it was actually hurting us to some extent. Because a lot of our software, when we're running it, well, it's using up you know, all 16 or 24 or 32, 64 cores of the machine doing the exact same thing. And with that kind of code, hyperthreading doesn't help, it actually hinders your processes. It got better with uh, the Skylake nodes, but we were still seeing the performance hit overall. So yeah, we turned it off many years ago. Data what sort of infrastructure do you have for uh, like Eastern University or Globus? Yeah. Okay. Globus is pretty much the answer to everybody's problem there. My personal opinion on Globus is that it's terrible. Oh yes, it's it sucks. But it's better than pretty much anything else out there. <laughs> Uh, yes, transfer of data between institutions or even between the user and the machine, it's horrible. It, it's a horrible situation. That We do have this one thing called Globus that we use. I didn't go into detail on it, but uh, it's an automated system where you say, hey, I want these files transferred, and it does it in the background for you, hopefully as fast as it can, sometimes not. Uh, yeah, you want to talk about data management. We're talking, we're right now purchasing a new uh, Lustre file system, and we want to transfer all the data from the old one to the new one. All two petabytes of it in tiny little 64K files. It's not good. It's not good at all. So that's going to take us months to do the full transfer. So if you can come up with a global file system that handles small files really well, do it, develop it, and then sell it to somebody and you know go retire somewhere because that's what's going to happen. I saw a question. Yes? You mentioned it being very hard to find people that are higher. What exactly are you looking for? Partially hardware experience, at least in, in, in my game, it's, it's uh, some hardware experience in a more industrial world. You know, if, you, if you've come out, what, anyone, <laughs> really. Strong Linux experience is pretty much required for us. Uh, this group is a great source, actually. Uh, having some knowledge of the hardware and just knowing your stuff, really. And unfortunately, what happens is, is that the people that actually know what they're doing, know their, uh, know Linux and uh, know the industry, they're already hired. They're already working. Yes? Is it a what? Where is that? Where is high performance computing as a service heading? Um, we've looked at doing high performance computing in the cloud. The pricing for it, unless you're doing, unless you're very, very bursty on your uh, research. So, you know, I, hey, I need to do this one thing of research, and then I'm not going to come back for six years or six, six months or something like that. It's perfect for that. And Amazon and all your other people, they can do that for you. If you're more consistent, you need to get your own cluster. 
it'll be cheaper in the long run. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, um, this is a problem that we are still fighting, and we don't really have a solution for it. Tape libraries are one way to do it. But it, 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 it depends on your data access needs. You know, sometimes they just want to put it away, and they'll never, ever, ever see it again, and they'll never recall it again. It's the people that do recall it. Okay, now you've got to pull it out. And typically, when they want to pull that kind of data out, they want it now, unfortunately. Yes? Uh, real, realistically, we don't have any compete, you know, as in types of MPI, like open MPI versus... Uh, Next to none. With the, the the users don't care as long as it works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have looked at. Uh, uh, are you talking in terms of the hardware or the more the MPI layer? So okay, MPI layer. Yeah, they don't care as long as it works. As long as it builds, they don't care. And we help them build those kinds of applications. Those applications for using Open MPI or just any MPI, uh, they are not that common, and the ones that are built out there or have the capability to use it are designed to use what we already provide, so it just works. Telemetry? For, from like monitoring? Uh, we're using a host of different things. Uh, Nagios is one. Um, Nagios, what's the other one? No. I can't remember what it is. I tried to connect to it recently and it wasn't working for me, so I just, I just sort of let it drop out of my head. <laughs> so I sort of gave up. Uh, for the most part, though, it's, it's Nagios. Yeah. So. Anything else? You got one minute, yes. I have one Omnipath switch uh, and a couple of cards for it, and they were actually given to us as a test. You know, here, try this out for us. Make it work. Uh, we did. It worked pretty much exactly as FDR did. It was exactly the same. And given that our entire group is, has 15 years of experience each in dealing with Mellanox, why would we switch at that point? You know, if you're if you're entry level and just coming into it, Omnipath would have been a good choice at that time. Right now, Omnipath two has been canceled. So, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't go up the Omnipath uh, road these days. Uh, we would have enjoyed seeing them actually come out with Omnipath two and actually competing because that would have kept Mellanox slash Nvidia. Uh, pricing down a bit, but right now the only game in town in terms of InfiniBand is going to be Mellanox. Uh, however, Ethernet is starting to make roads into the area, so we're now seeing 100 gigabit Ethernet. 